you are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Joel Salatin, farmer, writer, lecturer, and teacher. One of the most famous farmers in the world, Joel co-owns Polyface Farm in Swope, Virginia with his family. Hailed by the New York Times as the high priest of the pasture and profiled in the bestseller, The Omnivore's Dilemma, Joel Salatin is the author of 10 books, including The Sheer Ecstasy of Being a Lunatic Farmer, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, and You Can Farm. Welcome to Sustainable World Radio, Joel Salatin. Thank you, Jill. It's wonderful and a privilege to be with you. Oh, it's great to be with you. And I found the history of your farm, Polyface Farm, very inspiring. Your parents bought the land in 1961, and I believe from what I read online, it was kind of a worn out piece of land. And now in 2017, it sounds like it's an oasis of organic matter. And I believe you have 10 employees and you have four generations living on the farm and you're doing really well with sales. So I'm just wondering if you could tell us a bit about the land, what it was like when your parents first bought it, and then what it's like now, just to give us an idea of where you are. Sure. I think the best uh, illustration of what it was like when we came in 1961, you know, we're in the Shenandoah Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, which was, um, if you know your history, was any any American history book will say it, it was the breadbasket of the Confederacy during the Confederate during the Confederacy. I mean, this is where the Reaper was invented. Cyrus McCormick, you know, who founded International Harvester, invented the uh, the Reaper here in 19, in 1837, which is the official beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So, you know, this was a very fertile uh, valley when the Native Americans had it. The Europeans came, started plowing everything up uh, because there was, it was such rich land. And it, because of its elevation and rain shadow, we could grow really, you know, high-quality uh, small grains because we're in a rain shadow in this valley and our elevation. Well, over the next 150 years, you know, some three to eight feet of topsoil washed out. And on our farm, when we came in 1961, there was so little soil that when Dad started, you know, trying to rotate the cows around, or the cows and sheep around with electric fence, uh, there wasn't enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. So he actually poured uh, concrete in old used car tires, pushed a half-inch uh, pipe down in, in, in the concrete, and my brother and I, we were little kids, you know, six, seven years old, the two of us. Could, could get a, the edge of one of these uh, concrete tires and kind of tip it off the tractor platform as he drove slow down through the field. Then he'd go along and put the, the, um, the electric fence stakes down in the little half-inch pipes in those uh, concrete stanchions, and that's how he built the electric fence. Wow. So you know, I've been a lot of places in, on, on, the, in the, or on the world, you know, and I always ask farmer audiences, does anybody not have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes? And so far... All over, the, I mean, Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, you know, wherever, uh, Scandinavia, where I've been, nobody has said we don't have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. It was a pretty um, uh, gully. I mean, we had 16-foot deep gullies, uh, just great big areas, you know, half an acre of, of just nothing but shale rock. I mean, not a weed, not a vegetation, not anything, just, just down to, to solid rock. It doesn't sound like a very fertile, <laughs> a fertile beginning, Joel. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. But you know, you know what's what's interesting to me is that um, that that many of the, you know, kind of the icons of sustainable uh, farming. I mean, take Elliot Coleman uh, there in uh, New England. Uh, those of us who have done this, uh, by and large started on poor ground we didn't start on really good ground and and i think there's something about impoverished 
an impoverished context that makes you extra creative because you know for sure we we couldn't afford to just truck in soil right and and so you you have to look at your at your circumstances in situ you know and say where do we go from here and and uh, it it indeed i think makes you more creative than you would be if you were starting you know at a at a much higher level mhm that makes total sense so you got to try things out and see what worked well, yeah, there, we we did a lot of things uh, there early on. I mean, the first thing we did, we steep, steep, real steep hillsides that were just you know barren and, and gullied, and we, we fenced those out and got the cows off of them and got the animals off of them. And they, of course, on some of them we planted trees, others squirrels planted trees. But you know, over the years, those very, very steep hillsides. And when I say very, I mean, you know, stuff with a whatever, you know, a 15% slope, you know, hillsides that you wouldn't want to drive a machine on. And, um, and those, those have all uh, reforested now and, um, and, and stabilized. Uh, Some of the deep gullies, we just um, would cut, we would cut some branches and just carry them over and stick them with the butts facing downhill and the, the, the feathery branches facing uphill to just create kind of a, a, a filter so that when when rains came and the water ran, it would just slow the water down. Uh, a couple of places we actually just took rocks and put them in the bottom of gullies to form a, 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 a permeable dam, you know, so when the, when the water, when the rain gushers came, uh, it, would, it would come up to that, that little rock dam and it, it wasn't impermeable but it slowed the water down enough to make it drop its silt uphill, and we started getting terraces, you know, on the uphill sides. So, you know, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of that early work. I mean, Dad used to uh, go by the, uh, this was before, you know, in, in the early 1960s, most people that were growing corn for sale were still picking it by the ear and taking it down to the elevator. This was before, you know, combines and things. And so, um, so Dad would go down and um, bring home corn cobs. We got it. We had a dump truck, and he would go home down, and they would just they would just um, auger the corn cobs into our dump truck. He'd bring it home, and spread them out on these rock piles. Uh, essentially, we were just looking for organic matter wherever we could get organic matter. And very early, we bought a, a chipper, uh, a wood chipper, a, a pretty significant wood chipper, so that when we worked in the woods, we had a lot of forest on the farm. And so we started really looking at the forest as a biomass, uh, you know, a biomass incubation area to um, to remedy the biomass shortage in in the open land. And so we began this kind of uh, uh, a, a democratized biomass <laughs> program <laughs> where 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 the extra that was being created in one spot. Um, became the remediation biomass for, you know, a depleted spot. And uh, that democratization of biomass, uh, you know, really, really, you know, brought, started bringing things around. It's amazing to me that your parents had the foresight. It sounds like they were mimicking nature's patterns to replenish the land and revitalize it. Yeah, well, you know, again, uh, I think it's important, and 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 I'm I'm so glad today. Um, two things: one is that we were not moneyed people. I mean, we had we had lost a farm in Venezuela, South America. Dad lost everything. We had we had no savings. We had no we had nothing. Now, you know, in 1961, you could still buy land. You could you could get a mortgage uh, on the land itself. And so, uh, so that's what we did. But we, we we had no money, and so we couldn't go out and buy things and and put on the land. I mean, we couldn't even buy organic stuff if, if it had been available. And what? And so the the fact that the land was so poor, and we were economically uh, distressed, uh, that was a double creativity thing. And so Dad actually early on. Um, and you got to understand that my his father, my dad, my dad's father, my grandfather, was a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine when it came out in 1949. And Grandpa always had 
He never used chemicals. He had great big compost piles. He had integrated, you know, chickens and garden and stuff. He never farmed full time or anything like that. But he was very much a, a you know, a, a tinkerer and a, and an ecologist. Uh, he, in fact, uh, got the patent on the very first walking garden sprinkler. You know, the the ones that that walk along and roll up a garden hose yes. as they as they go. And uh, he called the, it was called the sprink reel. And he had the very first uh, uh, patent on a walking, on a, port, on a mobile uh, sprinkler. It's genetic. All this creativity is genetic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And, of course, you know, the older I get, the smarter Dad was. <laughs> and, and so he, you know, he bought into that ecology, but Dad was trained as an economist. And so he linked the ecology and the economy together. And he realized that the chemical approach was, was essentially, a, you know, a drug addiction, that you... You were on this treadmill, and you you kept you kept buying in this stuff, these chemicals or, or pesticides or whatever, and, and you were trying to you were trying to get ahead on the fertility, you were trying to get ahead on the bugs, you were trying to get ahead on the fungus among us, and 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 the result is you, you just you just can't beat it, you know, and and you run faster and faster and harder and harder, and you can't get ahead of it. And Dad brought in uh, consultants. Uh, both private and public, and said, okay, how do I make a living on this farm? And every single one of them said, plant corn, build silos, put in feedlots, graze the woodlands, you know, that sort of thing. And, mm. and, and Dad knew economically and ecologically that couldn't be the answer. I mean, convictionally, he knew that that couldn't be the answer. And so he turned, he turned essentially inward and said, uh, well, how do we how do we generate our own biomass? How do we build our own soil? How do we stop how do we stop the water runoff and the the silt running off? You know how do we do all that? And 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 really looked at nature's template and we realized goodness, you know nature nature moves animals. They're not stationary. Nature generates biomass on site. So we want to we want to generate it and keep it on site. Uh, nature decomposes on site. Nature doesn't move carbon around very far, so that drove us to to mobile, you know, mobile uh, uh, mobile control systems, electric fencing, mobile shelter, mobile water, and mobile, uh, you know, mobile feedstuffs. That that whole mobility. Um, you know, people say, you know, why are you so creative? How did you come up with all this stuff? Look, we're not really that creative. When you look at nature's temple, template, it's really fairly simple, and 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 the, the elegance is in the simplicity of it. And so our innovation uh, has been simply trying to mimic these four or five basic tenets of nature, and um, and amazingly, uh, so few people are actually <laughs> trying to do that. I know. <laughs> that, 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 it, that it made us appear real innovative. You know, that's crazy. <laughs> nature, take a bow. <laughs> yay for nature. Yeah. And yay for those yeah. who listen, right? Who listen, tune yeah. in and yeah. listen to that. And I do yeah. believe, too, that the lack of money can really help because you can't, you weren't buying all these machines and building all of this infrastructure. It was kind of like, what can we do and with what we have? And I think that really... Um, probably helped set the stage too for your dad. He was a man ahead of his time for sure. Oh, he was. He was. And and you know, and a man of conviction. My favorite story of him was he was about he was about 52 when the Arab oil embargo uh during President Jimmy Carter's time in the 19 uh late 1970s or well, mid mid 1970s uh came about. And um at that time, dad and mom never made a living on on the farm. Uh, the farm was a part-time thing. They both worked out to pay the mortgage, got it paid off. But um, Dad was at the time working as a uh, as the accountant and uh, blueprint estimator for a metal fabrication company. About it was about 17 miles away, actually. And um, by that time, he had gotten down to three days a week. His his thing was, if you're thinking, everybody should be able to to work themselves out of a job. In other words, the whole idea is if you hire on at 40 hours a week, you know, within a couple of years, you should be able to do the same amount of stuff in, in 30 hours a week um, 
because you're being creative and innovative and, and, and making short and, and doing it uh, more efficiently. Well, he had, he had started, you know, five five days a week, and then he'd gotten down to three days a week by this time. Anyway, my auto oil embargo came along. Guess what? He, he went out, and he's 52, right? 17 miles one way. I mean, we're living, living out in the country on his farm, has to drive across town. He buys a 10-speed bicycle and starts riding the bicycle to work and back every day. And he said, look, if everybody would do this, we could just tell the Arabs to keep leave the oil in the ground. We don't need you. Your dad but, is yeah, amazing. That's, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's conviction. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's conviction. That's living your, your values and living. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's great. Well, here's to your dad. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> One thing I loved about your work, and I, I was reading um, a lot of what you've written and on your website, is you say you have a redemption business, and it's kind of like a land healing ministry. And this fits in with that, because as many of us know, agriculture and animal agriculture are damaging industries. And, w- I mean, we could spend the whole hour talking about how it's the number one of the number one causes of climate change causing gases, the runoff from the pollution that runs off the farm, soil loss. I mean, the list goes on and on, unfortunately. But at Polyface, you and your parents and, cre- and, and son, I, I believe, too, and family have increased the soil organic matter from 1% to 8%. And so I want to hear more from you, and we've talked a bit about it already, about the potential of agriculture as a beneficial healing practice that, instead of being the problem, could also be flipped into the solution to many of our most pressing challenges that we face today. So if you could just share with us a bit about your philosophy on that. Sure. Well, that's a... It's a loaded question. (laughs) It's a loaded question because, you see, you know, the orthodoxy of our day is that, that uh, intensive agriculture inherently uh, depletes the commons. You know, it's the old conquistador mentality. You know, how do you, how do you make without take, right? And, um, and, and so uh, we, we run 180 degrees opposite that and say, actually, good intensive farming should increase the commons. There should be more soil, more um, clean air, more hydration, more water, um, and more social equity as a result of, of uh, farming practices. And so how in the world do you turn this orthodoxy on its head and present the heresy that farming can be actually ecologically uh, uh, you know, healing and positive? And so when we look at that, uh, again, if we look at nature as template, what we see are a couple things. One is it is highly integrated, not segregated. And so on our farm, we, we don't say we're cattle people or we're poultry or we're orchardists or we're dairy or we're, you know, wheat farmers. What we say is that we're simply stewards of a landscape that needs a lot of diversity on it in order to function symbiotically the way nature intends. And so, you know, there is no, there is no animal-less ecology on the planet. And yet in industrial farming from strawberries in California to, you know, corn in Illinois, our whole goal is we confine the animals over here and we put in these intensive crops over here and we don't integrate the two. We have a fundamentally segregated system. Well, you know what? Nature doesn't segregate. Uh, Well, I mean, it it doesn't grow bananas in in Ontario. I understand (laughs) that. But people do that, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but uh, but but nature nature is highly um, uh, diversified, integrated in its in its modality, and so so that's one of the reasons why we named our farm Polyface. We say, well, look, we're not we're not a single faced enterprise. We're a many faced, and that includes people. You know that we want we want more people on the farm. So so that that was that's a, a when you look at the template of industrial agriculture, you know, that's critical. Uh, I mean, two weeks ago I was in the Netherlands, and I got to visit one of these glass tomato farms, glass uh, house tomato farms, a 30-acre farm, two 15-acre fields, all under glass, LED lights under glass. And we had to put on uh, plastic boots, uh, uh, body suits, hair nets, and surgical gloves in order to, you know, to walk into the farm. And it's all hyd- chemical hydroponic, you know, tomatoes. I met several of these farmers, every one of them, 
is just between crises. You know, they, they essentially measure, they measure their farm experience and their life um, by the crises they've had. Well, we had the fungus here. We had these bugs here. We had, we had that soil disease. You know, no, they don't have soil. We had this, you know, disease there. And, and they, measure, they measure their agricultural experience in terms of, of, of epizootics. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm thinking, my, what a you know what a crazy way to farm um, that you're just you're either you're either coming out of or going into the next epizootic. Um, talk about fragility, but nature because of its diversity and its symbiotic, uh, um, you know, uh, different uh, species in, in proximate place, it creates. Um, pathogen, you know, pathogen cul-de-sacs, pathogen um, hurdles, blockades, uh, so that these things don't turn into epizootics. So, you know, that that was that was uh, that's one significant thing. The, the second thing is that nature, nature, um, per, it it wants to move more toward perennials, not annuals. And so. You know, if anybody's listening, they don't know what an annual is. An annual is something that grows up, makes a seed in one year, and you have to replant it. You know, squash is an annual. Corn is an annual. Um, you know, wheat is an annual. Um, you know, watermelons are an annual, okay? You have to replant them. A perennial is something like a tree, a bush, uh, a grass, um, many, of, many of the forbs, uh, herbs and things, mullen plant stuff, you know, that... that, that they, they live for a long, long time and come back year after year from rootstock. Now, nature certainly has annuals um, in, in the seed bank that sprout up quickly in a, in a disturbance phase. We, we generally call them weeds. But, um, but, but nature is primarily perennial. And, and the, the way to build soil is with perennial succulent forages. They're actually more... Um, efficacious at converting solar energy into biomass than trees or shrubs, uh, because the turnover rate is higher. The actual the actual uh, efficiency of the of the conversion of solar energy into biomass is actually more rapid and faster and more uh, it, 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 it's it's uh, it's more per acre. But these fast cycling perennials uh, have a also a fast cycling life. They're, they're, they don't. You know, they don't have a long, slow life like a tree. They, 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 they sprout, they grow, they die quickly. And so if we're going to keep them vegetative and green and, and growing and metabolizing solar energy, they need to be pruned every time they reach, they reach senescence. They need to be pruned back to, to stay vegetative. And the way nature does that is with the herbivore. The herbivore is the pruner. And to do it, the herbivore, it moves, it's mobbed up, and it's mowing. So moving, mobbing, mowing are the three characteristics of the herbivores worldwide. When we divorce the herbivore from this moving, mobbing, mowing ministry, then everything that is beautiful and soil creative and organic matter depositing, (laughs) sequestering, and all that, all of that positive turns negative. And so, you know, things like Cowspiracy and the UN Long Shadow Report and all that stuff, these are all indicative of, of scientists who are studying a dysfunctional system rather than a beautiful functioning system. And, you know, it would be, it would be similar to somebody from Pluto coming to study education on planet Earth and you know, they get dispatched from their tribe up in Pluto. You know, they go down. And... <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, and, and so and so you know, so the little flying saucer comes down and it happens to land in the worst school district, in the in the worst school with the worst principal and the worst teacher and the worst classroom in the country. They spend three days. They go back to Pluto and say, "Man, those people would be better off if they never had any education." Yeah. <laughs> so true. Yeah, that's similar to scientists who study. Seed lots, uh, uh, aquifer irrigation, monocultures, and our basic, you know, uh, uh, animal livestock industry, and see it as completely um, debilitating. Say and right back, say we'd be better if there were no cows, you know, if, if we didn't have any of this stuff. And from their data points, 
certainly you can see why they would arrive at that. But the, but the problem is they have completely um, uh, looked at an unnatural, right? Yeah, they're, 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 their data points are completely from the dysfunctional system, and they're not taking data points from very highly functional systems and, and systems that actually you know, mimic these, these great soil-building systems of nature. And really, if you've ever, and I'm sure many listeners have ever driven by a feedlot and just the stench is horrible, and I I just feel so bad for those animals. And then if you've ever seen pasture graze cattle, um, Mm. the difference, and seen I've seen many before and after photos of the land before the cattle were were sustainably and mob grazed there, and it's amazing how the land responds to this action. Yes, and you know if you if you smell it before you see it, there's probably something wrong. Mm. And <laughs> and it's what our land needs, right? All that manure yes. sitting there in yes. piles, which is waste, is the land is desperate for this fertilizer. It just is so. It seems obvious to me <laughs> what we need to do, but and, and that that's why I use the metaphor of pruning because uh, you know no, nobody goes by a vineyard where, you know, the, the people are out pruning the grapevines and says, you're destroying the planet, you know, uh, pruning those grapevines. And nobody goes by a, an apple orchard uh, and says, you're destroying the planet because you're you know, pruning the vegetation off of that tree. And, and, uh, and yet when those of us who practice this, this moving, mobbing, mowing, you know, uh, this, this pruning uh, natural biomimicry, you know, we're we're doing it for the same reason and doing it the same way. Fortunately, with you know uh, water piping and electric fencing and portable you know shelters now, we can actually we can actually move a herd of these herbivorous pruners around the landscape with the same precision as you would wield a pair of pocket uh, uh, pruning shears on a on a bush or a zero turn a zero turn, uh, you know, mower on a golf course. And these herbivores you're talking about are cattle and chickens, right? Not woofers and people. Yes. Yes. Uh, the the herbivores, the herbivores (laughs) are, are of course, plant eaters, you know, sheep, goats, cows. Uh, they're not even, I mean, yeah, chickens are fine, but they're actually omnivores. And and the reason I use herbivores and not cows is, is, is very, you know, uh, uh, it, it's a careful decision on my part because, you know, in the whatever, the radical environmentalist uh, um, dysfunctional agenda, the, the fun part is to pick pick demons, right? Let's pick cows, you know, let, let's pick these demons. And, and the reason I use herbivores instead of cows is because, for, as, you, as you indicated, cows now have this terrible... Uh, you know, prejudice against them, this bias in the in the orthodoxy of our world. It's almost as bad as wheat. Yeah, yeah, or, or corn or whatever. I want I want people to understand if they're going to that a a a well managed cow is just as valuable as a as a well managed zebra or a, an elephant or any other herbivore. You know, people flip over themselves and go backwards to try to preserve these other herbivores. And all we're trying to do is mimic the wild patterns on a domestic scale. That is not that is not the template that industrial agriculture uses. It has it has no um, whatever you know, no love, no honor for nature's patterns. It just says, how can we grow it faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper? You know, how else can you how else can you explain that for thirty years the U.S. duh I call it the U.S. duh <laughs> the USDA uh, you know took farmers like me to free steak dinners to teach us this new progressive scientific way of feeding cows where we grind up dead cows we feed them back to the cows and uh, and I looked around the planet and said you know where's the template for this where's the herbivore that eats that eats carrion. And I couldn't find it. So I looked at the U.S. duh and said, you know, I don't understand all the ramifications. I don't even understand. I, I don't even know if it's good or bad. All I know is there's not a template in nature. And so 
I'm going to I'm going to err on the side of nature instead of just assuming that well since there's no template I guess it's fine to do whatever we want to do. And of course, you know, uh I was laughed at for being a luddite, you know, what do you want to do go back to hoop skirts and uh, uh you know, hearth cooking and and washboards and you know, lo and behold 30 years later, right? Mm-hmm. There's a big global uh you know, oops, maybe we shouldn't ought to done that, <laughs> right? With uh bovine spongiform encephalopathy. So so nature does in fact bat last and we better we better humble ourselves and and seek rather than arrogating ourselves to hubris and adulterating everything that we see. Mm -hmm. It's so true. And, you know, I love the guiding principles of Polyface Farm, and they're really, they seem to be the antithesis of modern chemical industrial ag. And one of them, which ties into what we're talking about, is the individuality. And this really, you really stress how important it is to provide animals and plants with homes or habitat that allow them to express their physiological distinctiveness. And to me, that's just respect, right? Because there's no way that a feedlot at all allows that animal to express itself. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and, and it even goes to plants, um, hydroponic plants that are in these uh, completely sterile environments with basically, you know, feeding, uh, feeding IV, IV chemicals into their stems. You know, where's the, where's the microbial action? Where's the biology? Where's the, the actinomycetes, the mycorrhizae, the earthworms, and all, the, all, of that, all of that life that is communicating? I was just reading an article this morning that said 85 to 90 percent of all nutrient uptake in a plant has a, has a bacterial carrier. It has a bacterial component wow. to it. Wow. Um, and so, you know, why does why do soilless systems, you know, contain less taste, fewer nutrients, more water? Um, well, because they don't have this this amazing soil soil bank that is communicating, interacting, uh, uh, you know, trading trading molybdenum for some, you know, polysaccharide. You know, I, I like to call it an underground cafe. You know, yeah. like. <laughs> in Star Wars, you know, Star Wars mm-hmm. when uh, Luke Skywalker comes in to find a, a vessel and he runs into Han Solo and you got all that, you got that band over there, you know, playing all those weird aliens and stuff. And, and I, <laughs> I, view, I, view, I view the soil as that way, you know, hey, you know, this uh, two-headed whatever microbe walks up and says, hey, I got, I, got two, I got two units of boron in my pocket. I'll trade that for, you know, three, three shots of polysaccharide, you know. And, and, and this is this is what's going on in the root zone of the plant in this in this wonderful you know where the glomules are 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 are, are uh, have this this interface of of, of the plant and soil uh, community. It's not just dirt that you Clorox off your knees of your jeans. You know, it's 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 a living. It's a living community of beings. Yeah, it's a, it's a universe down there. There's a big party happening <laughs> as yeah. we speak, yeah. or we hope there's a big party happening, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, a lot of soils. There's it's zilch, nothing, and that's something too. You stress in the principles um, of Polyface Farm is the earthworms, and you say that you're really in the earthworm enhancement business, and that ties in with the soil biology and soil microbes. Yes, well, you know. Earthworms are are one of the few uh, big soil critters that we can actually see. You know, mm-hmm. most of them we can't see. They're they're microscopic, and uh, it should indeed give us all pause to realize that that we are completely and utterly utterly dependent on this on an invisible world um, that's down in the soil. The earthworms are the, the you know the the coolest and biggest and most physical manifestation of that soil community, and so. You know, in, in my view, essentially, we're we're in the earthworm business. You know, and if, if if we've got more earthworms this year than last year, then probably things are healing and on the uptake. And if we've got fewer, we're probably doing something wrong. I mean, that that's a you know that that sounds almost so simple. It's trite, and yet and yet the simplicity is the profoundness of the statement. That's the point. Mm-hmm. And so by by using okay so by using your grass based um, mob grazing the individuality of the plant and animal following nature's template 
the earthworm business, all of this is enhancing biology on your land. And I'm just curious, um, this has a huge effect on the land, right? And I'm wondering what effect do you think this has on the farmer and also the farmer's community by farming in this way? Yeah, well, <laughs> um, you know, this is this is uh, such a uh, it, it has spiritual implications, really, because um, you know, the average farmer uh, in, in orthodoxy today, I think, kind of lives with this with this wrestling mentality that I'm I'm in a I'm in a struggle. I'm in a struggle with nature. Uh, nature's a very reluctant partner. And I have to I have to get it in a, a half Nelson, you know, and 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 handcuffs and i've got a i'm gonna you know make you do blah 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 and um i i come at it completely differently i come at it that nature is actually a a benevolent lover and uh and not a reluctant partner and so from my perspective uh people ask me you know what fires your soul what makes you get up in the morning what makes me get up in the morning is to walk out the back door and realize that I can be a visceral participant in in healing land. I mean that. It, it, I mean it brings me to tears. That's how that's how powerful this is. You know how many how many people get to go out every morning and make this many beings happy by the decisions, by the footsteps we take, by the things that we do. Now, does that mean that we, you know, uh, don't cut any weeds or let the briars take over. No, 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 no. Um, that's all part of this of this stewardship. So yes, there certainly is is struggle and there there is sweat and there's. I mean, this morning I helped the crew. You know, we dressed uh, 250 broilers and 30 great big turkeys for a special restaurant account that wanted 25 pounders. Wow. And um, let me tell you, you know, I was dripping sweat by the end. You know, this is not, I'm not talking about we all just go out and, and, and <laughs> take our cup of coffee through the day and, you know, and. And, and say, I love you, land. This is yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, the, the, the work, the, the work is there. But it, but it really changes it to think, to think that I'm coming as a, as, as a loving partner as opposed to a conqueror, as a, in other words, it's, it's, it, I'm coming more as a caresser than a conquistador. Mm -hmm. That, that is a fundamentally different view of, 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 a, of a, an emotional and spiritual inter, uh, whatever, uh, interaction with the landscape. And, and, and to realize that as a result of me being here, I can leave it with more water, more soil, more you know breathable air, and more social equity. Um, and when I say social equity, I mean I mean people on the landscape. I mean, I mean the you know the, the people who love it like I do. I, I can leave it with more here in this spot because of the abundance. Uh, actually, you know, nature is a, is a benevolent lover that wants to bless us with abundance. And so part of our work is simply in, in knowing, um, <laughs> knowing how to touch, if you will, you know, to take that metaphor further, uh, knowing how to touch. And um, I don't want to turn this into some uh, X-rated uh, <laughs> interview, but, 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 you know, you, you, you see what, and, and as a, you know, as a, well, as, as a couple, you know, it, it takes time to learn what touch is good and what touch isn't, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 that, and, that, and that's the way it is here. We don't just walk out like a bunch of swashbuckling, you know, uh, uh, sailors and, and say, well, I'll shift this DNA to that DNA and I'll just pour on some poison here and get some poison here. And if I have a sickness, well, I must not have just used the right drug. And no, you know, our position is, our, our sense is nature wants to be well. The, the, the default position in nature is wellness. And if something is sick or diseased, I probably mess something up. That's a fundamentally different way of 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 learning than simply assuming, well, if something's sick or diseased, I just used the wrong bottle. 
That's so true. And say that a farmer is listening or someone that wants to get into farming and they they have land that is maybe monocropped. There's a ton of Roundup that's been sprayed on it over the years. Do you think, because I, I was talking to a farmer that is more conventional about this interview, and he said, well, I'm just worried if I switch to ecological farming, it would be, what was his quote? He thought he'd have low yields and it would just be chaos and a weed free for all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, um, uh, I, I think it's important to realize that we didn't get here overnight mm -hmm. and we won't get out of it overnight. And in fact, as my dad, you know, came to the conclusion in the, you know, in the in 1960, that the chemical approach is essentially a drug addiction. So, so what these conventional guys are in, they're, they're in a drug addiction situation. Um, and, and the soil's in a drug addiction situation. The land is in a drug addiction situation. And if you, if you pull that away, uh, it's going to go through withdrawal just like any other, you know, drug addict. And, and so, um, what, you know, what I, the, the, as, as Darren and Lisa, uh, say so eloquently, you know, the, the hardest climate to change is the climate of the mind. And so if you, if, if you, if you don't want any change, if you're perfectly comfortable and happy with, you know, what you're doing and you don't want any change, then, you know, uh, don't, uh, because you won't be successful only when you actually change in the climate of your mind uh, can you actually make a successful transition? And otherwise, otherwise, what you're going to do is subconsciously you're going to sabotage yourself because you don't believe in it anyway. And so you're going to fail just to prove your, uh, your initial assessment that, see, this doesn't work anyway, and so now I'm going to prove it doesn't work. <laughs> and and, and, and you'll, you'll actually... You know, even even if consciously you're saying, yeah, I'd like to try this, subconsciously you're going to sabotage yourself. So this is where I always say, you know, I've never convinced anybody into this, never argued anybody into it. You come with your heart. And we, we have this saying, you know, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, which is not actually true. What's actually true is you'll see it when you believe it. And 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 so um, so you need a you need a change of heart, a change of paradigm, change of worldview, whatever. And those kind of changes happen at different places for different people. Sometimes it's a it's a sickness. Sometimes uh, I mean I met one guy. He said mine mine happened when I picked up a carrot from my farm and realized I didn't dare eat this carrot until I went and washed it off. He says what's the deal with that? I can't even eat a carrot out of my own you know place. And that was that was his epiphany. Um, so you know everybody's everybody's you know whatever come to Jesus moment is is a you know, is a different story. It's a different um, you know we call this the final drop of water. You know uh, everybody has their different story, and, um, and and until until you have yours, all of this sounds like gibberish, pie in the sky. Well, he's living in Peter Pan, la la world. You know, come on, and uh, and and. You know, it doesn't work. But I can tell you here, um, you know, we're we're getting five times the production per acre of the county average. Um, that and and that's without planting a seed or buying a bag of chemical fertilizer in 60 years and starting on a rock pile. So you know, I, I, I um, when when these guys start into me that doesn't work, I just laugh. You know. <laughs> but it, it, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm way over I'm way over you know convincing. Uh, I've 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 watched this I've watched this literal transformation from the armpit of the community to arguably by any measure by far and away the most green verdant piece of property in the community, and I've watched that in my lifetime, mm. and that's pretty. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, that's so exciting because what, I mean, to revitalize a piece of land, it just must be the most rewarding feeling. Like you said, you just go outside and look around and think, wow, I got to participate in this and you were a willing participant. Right. Yeah, very exciting. And, you know, my permaculture teacher always said, don't beat people over the head with all your ideas and ways that they could change. Just lure people in by the fun of what you do or by how beautiful it looks or how good your produce tastes. And it sounds like that's kind of what you're doing, because Polyface seems like such a great community 
and your food is world renowned. Yes, yes. Well, again, I go back. I go back to Dad. Dad, you know, uh, when we when we started down this path, he he read some Andre Boisine stuff. I mean, this was this was before Alan Savory was doing his work. I mean, great goodness, I mean, he was so far ahead of his time. And uh, and we started did this controlled grazing, and we we started seeing some results, you know, very very early on, very quickly. And he made the mistake one day. He was down at a neighbor's place. And uh, he made the mistake one day of saying, someday we're going to have 100 cows on that place. And the neighbor just, he, um, dad, dad was not an indomitable public speaker like I am. He was a man of conviction, but he was not a public speaker. And it, it, um, it hurt him, mm-hmm. the way this neighbor derided him and laughed at him and everything crazy, you know. And dad came back, he says, I'll never again tell somebody what I'm going to do. He said, we're, he, said, he, said, he said, you can't push on a string. We can only pull on the string, and we're going to lead by example. Today, we run 150 cows on this place. <laughs> okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and, and today, you know, I, I miss Dad every day of being able to see the, you know, where this eventually went. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, we've definitely taken that position. Hey, you know, look, we we've got great neighbors. We love them to death. They're salt of the earth. You know, I always say, uh, all our farm neighbors, I'd trust them with my bank account, my granddaughter. I just don't trust them with my land or my food system. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, okay, that brings me to a question too of. Um, so we have this land all around the world. There's millions, I don't know how many acres, of depleted land, farmland in the U.S., all over the globe. Do you see this land as an opportunity that we could green or green the earth, revitalize neglected land, which would also help us with climate change, which is a problem facing us today? Is this an opportunity for us, just waiting? Well, a- a- yes, well, a- absolutely, and, and without question. So... Um, so the same way that we've done it here with, uh, with concentrating on carbon, carbon recycling, uh, animal movement, and perennial, perennials, along with water, you know, water development, building ponds, and, and I mean, we have eight miles of, of water lines, so we have fresh uh, gravity-fed water everywhere on the farm. I mean, you know, it's not like we don't spend money. We just spend money on projects that last for 500 years. Um, that's why I like to capitalize projects. So the fact is that if, I mean, I just, I just look at, yeah, you know, the, the, the global, the planet is often too big for people to wrap their heads around. So, so I, I just look at, at, at the Shenandoah Valley here where we live, which is 20 miles wide, 80 miles long. And I say, look, if, if all of the soil that is moved every year uh, to plant corn and beans to feed herbivores, which aren't supposed to eat it anyway, if all that soil movement were instead strategically moved up in the ridges and valleys and mountains surrounding us to build water impoundments for when there are floods and snow melt and hold that water high and, you know, and, and, and let it uh, gravity flow into the valley floor, by now, you know, if we'd have been doing that for a good while, uh, by now we would be drought-proof and flood-proof and would have literally recreated Eden here. Instead, we plowed everything up, shipped the soil down to the Chesapeake Bay, and have taken abundance and turned it into scarcity over 200 years. So, um, so yes, uh, you know, when you consider that um, that. 500 years ago, what is today the United States, 500 years ago, produced more food, more nutrition than it does today, it should give everybody pause um, about nature's templates. There were, when you, when you add up the bison, the wolves, the, goodness, the Native Americans, I mean, there, there were more people living in Nebraska and Kansas 500 years ago than live there today. Um, and, and, you know, the reason the continent was so empty when the Europeans came was because, you know, European, you know, measles and smallpox and stuff wiped out 90% of the population. If you had come, you know, a century before the first European came, it was quite a, 
I mean, it wasn't as many people as today, but it was it was a lot. And um, and and you know, we had uh, up to eight percent of the surface was covered in beaver ponds. There were two hundred million beavers. Uh, there were flocks of birds, passenger pigeons, which are now extinct, so big that Audubon sat under a tree in 1800. He wrote in his diary, he says, I haven't seen the sun for three days because the flock of birds has blotted out the sun for three days. You know, there weren't any, there weren't any Tyson chicken houses. There wasn't any wheat. There wasn't any uh, John Deere tractors. There was no chemical fertilizer or tillage. All of this was happening. All of this abundance was happening long before intensive agriculture came along. And so, so uh, uh, I don't want to exterminate farmers. I don't want to exterminate agriculture, but I do want to dip in to those historic templates. How did that function so beautifully and duplicate it on a on a domestic scale? And 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 we can now. We we can we can do we can take those templates and improve on them. For example, for example, instead of as the beavers were limited to building ponds on low ground in streams, we can now, with excavation equipment, permaculture style, build ponds way, way where there is no stream and create water where nature would have never allowed water to impound and get it higher on the landscape so we can let those raindrops turn over multiple uh, more times as they head down, uh, you know, uh, downstream. Um, you know, we can we can we have black you know we have a plastic pipe now so we don't have to just allow water to run downhill even like pa yeomans the australian their water for every farm you know we can now uh, if we've got a high pond we can get that water in a pipe and like on our farm we run it you know as long as the pond is higher than the hilltop once we got that water in a pipe we can gravity flow it uphill because of you know pushing it from a higher spot so we can go uphill, downhill, all over the place with clean piped water. Um, you know, a, a chainsaw. Uh, you know, the, the, the primitives. Their only um, tool uh, was fire for a tree and, and stone tools. We now have a chainsaw, so that instead of having fires and all these, you know, that we spend whatever five billion dollars a year fighting fires, if, if all of that biomass were either were chipped. Uh, for for carbon uh, cycling, for composting, or and or the biomass were grazed by you know intensively managed uh, animals, um, we we would we would convert that biomass into actual useful material that would build soil and sequester carbon and and rejuvenate the biomass so it's not so uh, so it, it's not as fire um, you know fire risky so. Th- you know, it, it, when you when you think about all the biomass that we're currently losing to, to fires, um, if all of that biomass were actually converted to um, to to decomposable material to go on the landscape, uh, I mean, goodness, out through Colorado, there you know there are millions of acres of dead conifers. Why? because of a no-cut policy, and so it has moved toward single speciation. If there were, if there were uh, uh, you know, normal um, access and cutting going on, there would be uneven ages, there would be a lot of more uh, different kind of diversity, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the, um, you know, the, the, the fire risk that you have now. So you know, when, you, when you add all those components up, the water, the biomass, the perennials, the animals, uh, and you add all that up, uh, we can absolutely do do nature and do one step better, but as a result of using our mechanical ability and intellectual capacity not to override nature, but to simply massage nature, to, to caress these templates into you know, a little more, a little more uh, uh, beauty. Mm -hmm. And how do we make sure, because I feel like many of us are not participants. I mean, we participate in nature, but I think we're kind of observers or we're looters, right? (laughs) Our current role (laughs) of looting. Um, How do we make sure we're beneficial participants, not just making huge mistakes in our quest to help nature? Well, yeah, I think, I think uh, that, that, that is, that is the question of the day. I mean, it, we can talk about all sorts of topics, 
Uh, but at the end of the day, um, if we the, the dog the dog that grows, you know the old uh, proverb, uh, which dog which dog wins? You know, two dogs. Well, it's the dog you feed. And so ultimately, we're talking about feeding a dog. Which dog? Well, it's a dog that that builds soil, sequesters carbon, blah blah blah. And what that means is you have to know the dog. You you've got <laughs> to uh, you've got to study you know which dog you want to feed, and which one has the best characteristics that, that you want to uh, encourage. And that means turning off Netflix. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> maybe putting aside the cell phone once in a while. Joel, this is just too hard. It's too hard, Joel. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm kidding. Well, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, listen. You know, hey, I'll tell you a story. I was I was uh, doing a doing a sustainability summit for two days in a in a school in Atlanta about two years ago, and I had about 200 uh, middle schoolers. They were uh, eighth graders in a in a big uh, you know theater room. And I asked them, I said, um, I said, how many of you can give me three vegetables that, um, that, you, can't, that you can't grow until after frost? When, when frost is done, then you can grow these vegetables. Well, you know, just silence, the whole room, silence. Finally, one timid hand went up and said, yeah, he said, uh, corn. I said, yeah, that's good. Okay, anybody else? And then another timid hand went up, you know, peppers. Yeah, good. Another timid hand went up, you know, uh, and, and tomato. Oh, good, good. I said, well, maybe you'll know better the plants that, that can stand frost. Let's do it the other way. I said, How, can you give me three plants that, that, that you can plant and they can take frost? Again, dead silence, you know, nobody. Finally, these sta- same three kids, you know, they probably have a garden at their house, right? One of them says, you know, cabbage. One of them says broccoli. One of them says lettuce. Good, you know. And the whole room's just really, really quiet. I said, all right. <laughs> Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you can give me the names of all of the Kardashian girls? The place broke into pandemonium. Chloe, Kim, Car, you know, they're just screaming like a bunch of, you know, hyenas. And so it took me five minutes to get them all settled down. I mean, that was such a, such a, (laughs) a, and, and, and finally all got settled down. I said, all right, let me ask you a question. In the big scheme of life, which of those two pieces of information is more valuable to life. The, you can hear a pin drop. Mm-hmm. That whole room of young people, they, they, they realize they've just been had. And, and, and to me, that is such a great illustration of where we are in our culture. Basically, if the NFL's on TV, beer's in the fridge, and the sofa doesn't have too many dog hairs on it, life is good. And, 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 we have become convenience-oriented, victim-oriented. We're, we're frenzied, hurried, and harried, running around, doing a lot of things, but missing out on some of the most important parts of life, including the fact that you and I and everybody listening to this, each one of us has the awesome privilege of being able to be visceral, tactile participants in legacy ecology. We can either move this needle toward legacy ecology or we can move the needle away from legacy ecology. But, you know, what's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing and hoping for a different result? We can't change that needle. We can't move it until we make changes and you know i wish trust me i wish i could snap my fingers and and the needle would change and nobody would have to do anything we could still drink four cokes a day we could go to mcdonald's and we could be totally ignorant of which plants grow in frost and which ones don't and everything would be wonderful for our grandchildren the fact is if we want to change the trajectory of ecological legacy we have to change our participation in that trajectory. I wish there were a different way. I wish there were an easier way. I wish there were a faster way, but there isn't. So ultimately, every one of us bears a little bit, you know, not all, obviously, but every one of us 
bears a cumulative amount of responsibility in that in that trajectory. Yeah, and I know we're getting to the end of our time together, but I just wanted to find out. So, what can um, yeah. maybe non farmers eaters, yeah. right? We all eat. What can yeah, we gotcha. do to become a participant in this planetary okay. healing through agriculture? Love it. All right, I got three things okay. quickly. Three. Number one. Number one is get in your kitchen, okay? Not until we become, uh, whatever, participants in the food system do we actually learn to, um, you know, learn about about food. And so, um, I mean, Michael Pollan talks about, you know, buying at the outside of the, gro- uh, of the supermarket. I'd go one step further and say buy outside the supermarket. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, get in your kitchen and, and, and start participating in food. Make meals from scratch. Um, you know, the, 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 the single, in my view, the single biggest definition of a, of a person who's changing the tra- trajectory is, are you eating leftovers? Because the single service, single service packaged graze item you know, where, where the family just grazes through the day, nobody eats together, nobody eats a meal together, you don't prepare anything, you just kind of, I'll take this packet and that packet, and, you know, I just graze through the day. That That is the, the height of processed food and convenient ignorance. So, one, get in your kitchen. Number two, do something yourself. I don't care whether it's a vermicomposting kit under your sink or throw out the dog, the cat, the gerbil, and put in a, a two uh, kitchen chickens eat your table scraps and give you two eggs a day i don't care uh maybe it's a beehive on the roof maybe it's a a pot garden on the patio i mean you know it can be a legal pot garden but a pot uh, you know (laughs) that would help with the stress of dealing with all the environmental right right (laughs) exactly exactly so but the point is do something to dip your life into the mystery and awesomeness of life and 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 what this does is help you to appreciate you're not the center of the universe. There's something much bigger going on beyond you and me. And when we grow something, when we participate in something and watch red wigglers eat our kitchen scraps or whatever, when we do that, it's just it's 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 tantalizingly and mesmerizingly compelling to appreciate there is there is a pulsing, a sentience, a a, a a thing going on here that's, that's bigger than us. And it, I think it invokes curiosity. It awakens our yes. curiosity again. Yes. yes, absolutely. And finally, number three, number three, uh, so the first, get in your kitchen. Number two, do something yourself. Number three, um, take your entertainment budget for the year, time and money, one year, that entertainment budget, and turn it into a food treasure seeking opportunity in your community today we have more alternative you know what i call integrity food producers than ever they're easier to find they're more accessible if you'll take all of your entertainment and recreation budget for one year one year to discover your your food chain your food treasures in your community by the end of one year you will have your your farmers lined up. You will have that food relationship lined up. You will be skilled. You will have exercised your discernment muscles, and you will be knowledgeable and skilled, and you will be able to walk boldly into next year as a head-held-high participant in environmental legacy trajectory change. Oh, I That's love cool. it. That really gives me hope. And that's one question I had for you. Do you feel, because I, lately I've been feeling really um, distressed about, <laughs> usually I'm an optimistic person, but environmentally I just feel like we're, we're the tra- trajectory we're on just seems to be so dark and disconnected from nature. I'm just curious, are you hopeful about the future? Do you think we can turn things around? Well, I think we can. Um, uh the, the, the question is, will we? Um, you know, it, 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 when you when you look at the historical um, historical precedent, 
you know, collapse and, and uh, <laughs> Easter Island, you know, and things like that, um, you realize that that if you're a betting person, if, you, if you're betting on uh, whatever, you know, actuarials, you'd bet that we're not going to turn it around before, you know, dire consequences. And, and you know, and there, there, are, there are numerous, um, you know, things, whatever, confluing, uh, that, you know, merging that, you know, from, from you know, uh, pathogenicity to, uh, to soil running out, to water running out, to minerals running out, to, you know, health, uh, sickness, disease, diabetes, uh, numerous things escalating, uh, infertility, I mean, uh, infertility in the West, in the developed uh, countries uh, is, is like, Forty uh, percent what it was fifty years ago, and interestingly, Africa has not seen a single uh, diminishment in in I'm talking about male fertility sperm counts. Um, uh, Africa has not seen any change in the last fifty years, and in the West, we've seen a drop of like sixty percent. Th- th- these are these are these are big issues, and and. Um, you know, so if you read Malcolm Gladwell, you know, tipping point outliers and things like that, most of the time big change doesn't have until there is some, you know, some tipping point, some thing. And um, I mean, some, things, some people think it's going to be the economy, you know, that everything's going to crash. I, I, I have no clue, and I'm not a prophet. So the one thing I don't do is say, what do you see 20 years from now? I have no clue, no idea. But, but I, I think... One thing that we can learn from studying history is that normally things have to get really, really bad to get the attention of the average person. I, I think that's pretty much a, you know, a, a historical precedent. Right. And uh, how, how, how bad is that bad? Well, it's pretty bad, you know. <laughs> the Huns come in and take over Rome, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> how and, bad can it get? We don't want to find out. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, can we change it? Oh, we could ch- we could change it so fast it would make your head spin. Um, but 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 you know, will we? Do we? You know, do we care? You know, what what's the average? You know, what's the average person? Where are we going to go? So, um, you know, I, I we certainly can, but I I'm I'm pessimistic in the short view. I do believe for sure that that the way we're farming. Is the only way to go sustainably, regeneratively over time, and I think it will ultimately win out. The question is, you know, what has to happen before the average person um, that's at McDonald's and Burger King, before that person has their wake-up call? So all hands on deck, everybody. Yes. Time to get involved. And lastly, um. On your website, it says that at Polyface Farm, you heal the land and germinate farmers. And I would love to hear about, do you have courses and apprenticeships, internships that people can get involved if they want to learn from you and your family? Yes, we do. We have a very formal apprentice, uh, intern and apprenticeship program. We, we essentially have uh, a five-month intern program in the summer, and then, and then uh, three of those interns, um, can move on into the master, kind of the graduate program, which is uh, apprenticeship. Then that goes for 12 months, and um, we we take about 10 interns usually every summer, um, and so we have a very formal you know vetting process. There's a 10 day uh, August 1 to August 10 every year. We take queries, and then we um, we pick about 40. We invite them for two day checkout. That'll be November 1 to 10. Those 40 will come over that for, for two days, uh, pick two days during that 10-day period. And then we pick our 10, and that starts you into this process. And, um, and yeah, we, we invest a lot. In, in we, I do formal lectures. We do field trips. We, it's a total immersion, you know, immersion experience. You live on farm. Uh, as a team, and uh, we eat together. We have an on-farm chef for those five months who fixes our evening meals so we can all eat communally, about 25 of us every day. That's the farm community. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite an experience. It's life, life-changing, and, um, 
probably some of our most important work now. Mm, that's wonderful. And for more information, you can visit polyfacefarms.com. That's the website. And then just to get an idea of some of the delicious food um, and products that you sell, it's polyfaceyum.com. So polyfacefarms.com for the um, website. And Joel, do you have anything else you'd like to share with listeners today? Uh, no, I think, I, think you've, I, think you've, I think you've covered a lot of it. I mean, when people ask me for that final word, you know, I, I always say, look, look, here, here, here's, here's the important thing. Um, we don't use this word very much, but, you know, in our, again, we have become such an instant gratification culture with smartphones and Netflix. And, I mean, you know, if, if, if the website doesn't pop up in two seconds, it's too slow, you know, we're gone. And, and we've just become this, this incredibly impatient with our high-tech, our, our sophisticated technology. We're impatient with, with our meals. We're impatient with our relationships. We're impatient with information. And, and, yet, and yet, nature moves at its own pace. No matter how frenetic you get, how impatient you get, the sun does not hurry its rising. It does not hurry its setting. The fish don't get in a hurry. You know, you watch them swim and they just continue to, they do like they've done for a thousand years. Um, and so my encouragement to folks is appreciate the slog. We don't use that word much, slog, S-L-O-G, the slog. But, you know, a lot of life, is slog, cleaning toilets, folding clothes, uh, um, turning compost, um, separating the red wigglers from the earthworm casting. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, it has a level of excitement, but a lot of it is, is, is routine slog. And, and the, the, the excitement, the, the, uh, you know, the joy is not in finality the joy is in the journey the discovery and so enjoy the slog yeah it is it is you know routine day uh but but nature while it's amazing and it's it's fascinating to study and learn more um generally you know the frog gets up and does the same thing every day you know and (laughs) and, and, and and no frog no frog can get up this morning and say you know what I think I'm going to sit out today. I'm just not going to participate. I'm just going to I'm just going to sit here and not participate in this game. I, I'm just going to take it easy. None, none of them none of them does that. And so enjoy the slog, enjoy the participation, and just stay with it. Get on the right course. Get on the trajectory. And then and then don't quit. Stay with it. Don't quit. Stay with it. And over time, you will find that deep inner satisfaction and joy that comes from playing the right game over and over, getting good at it, better at it, and knowing that you've been part of the healing. Thank you so much. This has been very inspiring and also entertaining as well. (laughs) (laughs) Good. It's been a privilege to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jill. Take care. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening.